Thank you very much. Uh, you'll be very pleased to hear I'm not going to say very much because it's actually Richard's project that we're here um, to, to listen to today. But what I thought I'd do is just give you a very brief introduction as to why Richard might have ended up in the Department of Pathology within Cambridge when his project is about pig genetics. Now, some time ago, our group in particular had uh, a, a, a PhD student who came from a company called PIC, or the Pig Improvement Company. And as a result of that original PhD studentship, we went on to have a number of collaborations with the company and other external bodies. So this, this just gives you an overall idea of the types of things we have been doing with pigs in pathology. So the original projects that um, PIC were involved with were those funded by the EU, which on this slide are in a sort of pink background. Uh, we did a lot looking at host and pathogen interactions, so the genetics involved both with bacterial infection, in this case a bacterium called Haemophilus parasuis. Uh, there we actually got a much better understanding of some of the virulence factors in the bacterium, but we also discovered about 10% of the animals that we used in our trials were naturally resistant to the infection. Then, in conjunction again with uh, a number of institutions across the EU, we had a quality pork genes or QPG project, which looked at factors involved with stress and muscle development and fatness in pigs. These are all highly relevant traits in terms of what Richard's intending to do uh, with his future work in Ghana. And the biodiversity project for which Samples were collected from about three or four hundred different breeds of pigs across Europe and across China to compare their genetic backgrounds. And in fact, it's from that particular project that a lot of the work has been done that's contributed to the uh, SNP projects and the SNP chips, which are now used quite routinely by labs who are interested in looking at pig genetics. Uh, and right at the top, we also have a DEFRA, what was originally a DEFRA-funded funded project, looking at an inherited behavioural trait in pigs. Behavioural traits are notoriously difficult, and we're still working on it, but we seem to be getting somewhere, so watch this space. So as I said, part of the biodiversity project and the work carried out within our own lab, looking at candidate genes for these other um, EU um, collaborations, generated a lot of polymorphism, they went towards the pig genome project and a lot of those markers are now part of the pig SNP chip. And more recently, we have been working on that very neglected Y chromosome. Unfortunately, males get very underrepresented when it comes to genome projects. So we have just put together a first generation sequence map of the pig Y chromosome and in conjunction with the Sanger we've also worked on improving the pig X chromosome. X and Y chromosome is a bit of speciality of our lab, uh, particularly as a lot of our background work within human and mouse genetics has stemmed from wishing to understand infertility in humans and other animals in greater detail. So that's a little bit of the background. But the real point is that as a consequence of all these collaborations, our lab has contacts with a number of other institutions and individuals who are, we hope, going to be of use to Richard in the future. And when he was here last year, we were very fortunate in that because of other meetings going on in and around Cambridge, he was able to meet people like Alan Archibald from the Roslyn, who has been paramount as one of the UK contributors to the Pig Genome Project, and again, very interested in pig biodiversity. Uh, representatives from PIC, now part of Genus, one of the biggest um, animal breeders in terms of cattle and pig genetics. The Animal Health Trust, where we have connections with their um, genetic specialists. We also have links to Hua Zhong University in Wuhan, um, where again, their scientists are particularly interested in animal genetics and in improving 
animal breeds within China, through the projects relating to viral and other infectious diseases, we have links with the Animal Health and Veterinary Laboratory Agency, projects we've done in conjunction, as I say, with the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, and just at the bottom to acknowledge funders for those projects, including DEFRA, the BBSRC, and the European Union. So I'm now going to hand over to Richard, who is, I'm sure, going to give you a much more interesting flavour of what is going on in pig genetics in Ghana. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much, Carol. Um, I bring you greetings from the University of Ghana, where I teach. I am very privileged to be here. This is the second time I'm in Cambridge. Last year, I spent a wonderful time here. I also like to recognize my main uh, supervisor, Professor Nabil Alfara, who has been a, a great force uh, to support me. Uh, Nabil, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the work that brought me here and the origin and phylogenetic status of the local Ashanti dwarf pig of Ghana. And uh, we are using evidence from three sources, mitochondria DNA analysis, uh, MC1R, that is the gene responsible for coat color, and then Y chromosome uh, haplotypes. Um, I will tell you briefly the reason for this work, uh, give you, tell you about the work we've done, and then some results, and then what we intend to do in the future, all within 10 minutes. Uh, as a background, and as most of you here are connected to Africa, you know that we continue to be a net importer of animal source foods. And with population explosion expected to happen and hit the billions, we can never keep peace. Now, in terms of global trade, our share is, as a continent is just a mere 3%. And protein consumption in sub-Saharan Africa happens to be 53 grams, the only area in the world which is below the safest level for uh, an adult. So what I'm trying to say is that in terms of balance of trade in animal products and more nutrition, we are at a very bad uh, place. My country, Ghana, is not different from this. Um, we have never attained self-sufficiency in protein production. Uh, we continue to import around 55% of all we need. And uh, to, to solve this problem, we think that we have to look at our local breeds, not because of the diversity they offer, but because those are the breeds most of our people are keeping. Now, I want to introduce my friend. Carol showed you a more polite pig, but this is the Ashanti dwarf pig from my country, uh, the object of my research. This breed has been kept by our people for many years. As you can see, it's quite a hardy animal, resistant to most of the endemic diseases. Uh, the meat is very nice. Uh, Prof. Farah has not tasted it yet, but I've promised him he will definitely have a taste of this one day. Um, this is the breed that the small-scale farmer is able to keep. It does not require too much input by way of buildings or feeding because it can feed on even fibrous material. Experiments carried out at the university farm indicate in the past uh, when we have limited feeding, uh, most of the exotic and crossbreds did not survive, but this animal is able to go on. Um, so what did we, why did we choose the pig? Uh, one thing we should also know that it's a litter-bearing organism and uh, it's, it's also has got a shorter generation interval compared to cattle, for example, and therefore it's a good point to start if you want to uh, increase uh, protein production. Unfortunately, there was a problem. We didn't know where this breed originated from. The literature is conflicting on its origin. Um, even though people appreciate it for various reasons, the, the genes responsible for these had not been identified. Uh, sometimes, in an attempt to dance to the market and uh, get more money or dollars, people have tended to crossbreed without any plants, uh, which we call indiscriminate crossbreeding. So to date, there is no sustainable breeding program for this breed. And what we fear is that we might lose certain things that may be good about this breed uh, in the long term. Of course, this morning we held that uh, in Africa, there is generally a low human and institutional capacity in animal genetics. So one reason for this uh, collaboration is to increase our knowledge about animal genetics as well. Um, the problem was not over. Uh, over the last decade or two, we have had the emergence of various local pigs. 
And the question is, if your Ashanti black hat got certain breeds, um, if I show, uh, how does it work? <laughs> is it this? Yeah, if, if you assume for, for the sake of time that this is the Ashanti black pig, then all these guys have come up over the years. What you do is you get what we call genetic dilution of anything that you think was good in that animal. So in order to stop that and also really document what we have, in order to make a case for their conservation, it was important to go into their uh, genetics. So what were our research objectives? So we wanted to utilize this science of genomics, uh, which the Western world is mostly focusing on in terms of finding a uh, cure for diseases and so on, to also determine the origin and characterize this, the unique attributes of this pig. We wanted to select and maintain beneficial alleles, which will confer traits of economic importance, and also develop a more robust uh, crossbred local pig. So we just didn't go straight to the animal and took the samples and did uh, continue with DNA and so on. But we, we had to interact with the people who keep the, the, the animals. We had to ask them their reasons. We have to ask them some information about their experiences uh, in terms of feeding, housing, and so on. And then we went ahead to sample because we decided to take the ear tissues for DNA. And then after sampling, we uh, used the Kiagen uh, Denizi blood and tissue kit to extract the DNA. And then we decided to study, in terms of the origin, the mitochondrial DNA is known to give you an idea about its maternal origin. So we looked at the, the particularly the deal loop region. And also for the coat color, we looked at the gene MC1R. So we followed the normal protocols in the lab, and then we did some SNP genotyping to be able to find out really some of the key genes that are published, how our animal fits. And we used the Illumina SNP uh, 60KB chip uh, in the lab of Prof. Afara, and this is the facility where we did that work. So what did we find? Uh, in case of uh, the husbandry practices, as you can see, uh, it's nothing to write home about. People are keeping this breed uh, in a very dilapidated uh, condition, a very bad structure. In fact, it's very difficult to uh, call this a housing, but believe you me, that is what they have. And uh, in terms of feeding, uh, if you look at the slide here, this is just some leftover from some other uh, food processing industry, dried, and that is what the animal is going to feed on. And these are pigs. And uh, you can look at this. Uh, when we went sampling, sometimes for the very small animals, you can never do anything with them because they will escape. There is no facility to hold them in there. So this is the kind of condition under which this animal is breeding. So for our next phase of the project, we think that even with an improvement in the husbandry practices, one can achieve a lot. In terms of the mitochondria analysis, we realized that our animal, the ADP, is closer to the European uh, Swiss breeds than the Asian. So that tells us that in terms of maternal origin, they seem to uh, be more European than Asian. Um, this will explain it further. If you focus on this first one, I'm talking about the mitochondrial DNA in, the, in our animals that we brought to Cambridge, and the majority of them seem to have uh, these genes which are more European than Asian. If you compare the ADP in terms of mitochondrial DNA and MC1R, still, even in MC1R, the majority have the European type. However, what was interesting was that this Asian group seemed to come from a particular part of the country, that is, as you move from the coastal to the uh, Guinea savanna zone up north. Now, when we compare the ADPs with what we call crossbreds, animals that we know from the farmers' records that had been crossed with some ex exotics, Again, majority of them had European, and most of these have used European males, and that is, that's what explains that. Now, so in, in, in conclusion there, we could say that the traditional local breed has a higher percentage of Asian MC1R alleles for black coat color. However, in terms of the overall uh, population, the European alleles are more, and that is because the sporting allele is also having an European uh, background. In terms of regions, as I have said, the upper uh, west region and the northern region have the highest uh, Asian black alleles, and I'll show you that in another diagram. Now, in this PCA analysis, this group of ADPs are coming from the northern and upper west region, 
And these are the animals that have got the Asian uh, haplotypes. These are ADPs, all right, but they have mostly European, whereas these are the, uh, the crossbreds, and then we have some few exotics that we use just as controls. So what this tells us is that we still, in the northern part of the country, have got, uh, if you will like, a certain unique group that one can call uh, Ashanti dwarf pigs. And if we want to start any conservation program, that we need to focus on. We can focus on this group and that group. This is more European, this is more Asian. In this situation, you cannot say much because there is too much uh, admixture in, in that uh, population. So have we achieved our objectives? In terms of the first objective that we set ourselves, determining the genetic diversity and origin, I'll say we have done that. In terms of the second objective, to identify uh, the genes responsible for growth, carcass reproductive and disease resistance in this breed, work is still ongoing. Uh, there is still a lot of work to be done. We are still analyzing data uh, and we're still looking for more funding to do further work on this uh, to be able to draw very firm conclusions. We want to go ahead and develop a genomic selection scheme for this animal that will be in the next phase of the project. But what is good news is already we are building ca capacity in the genomic characterization of pigs. Uh, I have both masters and PhD students who are studying uh, whatever I learn here. Uh, Carol tells me I go and tell them. <laughs> that is a very way to transfer knowledge. But we are, we are building capacity. We plan to organize uh, several workshops uh, as the next phase goes on. And we hope that this will help us to uh, know this breed better. So, um, for the next uh, phase, where we have already a concept note and uh, seeking funding, we are going to identify more SNPs for adaptive and economic traits in this breed. We want to see how, in the original population, these have been affected by crossbreeding, and then develop a breeding program for this breed. Um, in terms of other opportunities that we got as a result of this collaboration, we were able to network with colleagues who are working on pig genomics, as Carol indicated. We have also had a chance to meet with very eminent scientists who are interested in helping build capacity in animal genetic resource characterization in Africa. Yet, we welcome more collaborators. Um, in terms of, since today is a special day for Cambridge in Africa program, we wanted to offer these uh, suggestions that future calls will be targeted to specific thematic areas rather than academic disciplines because we want to encourage interdisciplinary and innovative research. And uh, KPRES should aim at establishing a sustainable project that can put the name KPRES uh, project on in Africa. Uh, what I'm trying to say here is that some of our projects cannot be achieved within the time frame that the fellowship is awarded. And therefore, possibly if we can look at some of them and give them more time, instead of to make it five years, probably they can achieve more and you'll see more tangible results. In terms of appreciation, I'd like to thank my professor's lab, the Mammalian Molecular Genetics Research Group here in Cambridge. They were very wonderful when I was here and they supported me and helped me in so many ways. Uh, time will not allow me to mention names. Of course, Kipres brought me here, Cambridge in Africa, thank you very much. We got funding, I think it was 10,000 pounds, Afara? Yes, from the Al Burada Trust and we are asking them for more. And for all of you here, I say thank you very much. Thank you.